Well, good morning, CLC. We're so glad you're here at 1045. We want to invite you right now to join with us as we celebrate a God who is limitless, a God who can do anything. And we want to invite him into this place, into where you are, and say, God, we want you to do what only you can do. So right where you are, let's sing with faith and celebrate today. Come on. It's your heart we're searching for. We want you and nothing more. Let your glory fill this place. We're alive in your presence. It's your heart we're searching for. We want you and nothing more. Let your glory fill this place. You're alive in your presence. We surrender all to you. Do what you want to. Do what you want to. God, we love to see you move. Do what you want to. Do what you want to. standing in your light and our hearts are open wide better see more than before Lord come have your way here we surrender all to you do what you want to do what you want to God we love to see you what you want to do what you want to yeah. in our church in our lives have your way Lord oh all consuming fire fall fall
Yes, God, yes, Lord. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me yet. Ooh. I know the night won't last. Your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Oh, yeah. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again. And so I raise this praise to you, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never Great is your faithfulness to me. You are so faithful, God. You're faithful, God. You're faithful, God. And I'm feeling the palm of your hand, God. Because you never let me go. You never let me go. This is my confidence. You never, 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 never fail. thank you this morning that you never fail your word never fails your promises never fail God 
And God, uh, whatever uh, situation people are facing uh, today, I just pray that you would meet them where they're at. Because we just sang about our miracle-working, mountain-moving God. And God, we believe that you are in every situation that we face. You were able to move mountains, God. You were able to work miracles. And so we ask for that this morning. We ask that you just move in our hearts and lives and do what only you can do, God, and have your way in our lives and in this service today, God. We want to be different after seeing this service than when, when we started. And uh, just continue to work in our lives, God, uh, as, as we're facing uh, just a, a season of things that are different and change. Uh, uh, God, we just pray that you would change our hearts for the better through this. Uh, and just thank you for all that you are, God. Thank you for all that you're going to do today in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. Amen. And amen to those of you that are watching online. Thank you guys for tuning in. Welcome to CLC Online. So glad you guys are here with us live. Uh, tell us what's up in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from. Uh, last service we had some of our friends in Eswatini, Africa watching. Uh, so let us know where you're watching from. I know uh, Troy and Tip seem far, but if you're watching from Africa or, or Germany, let us know that too. Uh, and in this season, uh, we are spread out. And you've seen some of our worship team. We've, we've been here uh, over the past few weeks, uh, small numbers of us, but we haven't been able to all be together. And uh, over the past month or so, I've done some FaceTimes and Zoom calls with the family and friends. I know you guys have too. And so this weekend, as we're talking about the Word of God, we thought, what if we could do a Zoom with our worship team? So check this out. When we believe, all chains are breakable. When we receive Yahweh, you keep your promises. If you said it, we believe it. If you said it, hey. if you said it, we believe it.
care where you are at 1109 this morning. Give it up for our worship team all across the community coming together to bring you an amazing kickoff to this weekend's message. If you said it, you believe, we believe it. And uh, I just want to kind of read some things that God said in his word. And I want you to agree with me on that. And when I read it, I want you to say, if he said it, I believe it. All right. The first is Romans 8, verse 37. Listen to this, what God said in his word. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Say it with me. If he said it, I believe it. Come on now, all right? Uh, the next verse, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. He said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, confidently, that the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Ready? If he said it, I believe it. And then John 14, 27, how fitting is this for a pandemic season? Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled. I don't care how long the pandemic lockdown lasts. I don't care what they say about the economy, what they say about the rest of the world. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Ready? If he said it, come on, I believe it. And then finally, John 15, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. If he said it, I believe it. Jesus gives us joy regardless of situation. Jesus gives us peace in every circumstance. And yes, we didn't see this coming, this lockdown, this pandemic. We have all kinds of opinions now about how it's being handled, when do we come back. But the bottom line is he gives us peace. He gives us joy. He is our helper. He will not forsake us. And if he said it, I believe it. I know you do too. Welcome to our series we continue, Christians Are. This weekend we're talking about Christians are people who look to the book. It's the Bible, it's God's Word, and we are people who turn to this, who live by this. And uh, this series uh, has been one that's been well received, although I'll tell you what, we miss you being here. Um, each week we're getting a little bit more. We have more, more, more vocalists, uh, tech volunteers. It's just good to see people. Wednesday night I got the chance to interview with Pastor Chris, four of our graduating seniors. It was just so nice to see them and have them in the building. And we can't wait till you're all here with us. And so we are finalizing reentry plans. We'll, we'll unpack that for you the next couple of weeks, let you know when we're going to start that. In the meantime, we hope you stay safe. And we're glad you're with us online. And uh, it's gone long enough. I don't know about you. I'm kind of tired of it by now. And uh, you've heard me say, though, to keep your sense of humor. I read this. No offense. I thought it was funny. I'm starting to miss people I don't even like. <laughs> you know what that's like? Just to be around people. And so if you have a humorous thought or a joke, go ahead and put that on the chat line, uh, the chat room. Speaking of the chat room, I, when I was off a few weeks ago, I watched us online and I watched the chat and I realized how different generations think differently. I remember when I was in college, I, I'm the kind of person I have to have a kind of quiet, no distractions. Uh, I would literally go to the, the library because the dorm was too noisy. I'd go up to the second story in the back. There'd be little cubicles, just a small desk with walls on it so I could sit there and not get distracted. That's when I can concentrate. I remember fast forward, our daughter was in high school, a straight A student, she was doing her homework one night. I went up there to help her with math. I think it was 10th grade. And I remember looking at her math for a few minutes, and I finally, in a moment of honest humility, had to say, Lauren, from now on, all I can do for you is pray for you. <laughs> because it was beyond me. But I remember going in, and she had music playing while she's doing homework. I'm like, how can you concentrate with music going on? And she said, it was a light bulb for me, Dad, if there's not music, I can't even think. I can't just think when it's quiet. So, Wow. And so I remembered that when I was watching the message a couple weeks ago and the chat room's going, okay, and I don't know, 
between the way I think and adult onset ADD, which I think I have if there's such a thing, I could not pay attention to the sermon with the chat going, so I had to fold my iPad case up to cover up most of the chat. But those of you who are chatters, chat away. We're glad you're with us. And I'll ask you to respond some uh, throughout this service. So I want to hold up for you uh, two books. Uh, They have something in common. This is the owner's manual to my 2005 Chevy Colorado pickup truck, almost 230,000 miles and still going strong. When I have a problem with that Colorado, I will often look to this, or when I had to learn how it worked, the different uh, options on it, I would turn to this to read directions, how to use it, how to take care of it, when to service it. Uh, and, And turning to this owner's manual has helped me both problem solve and know how to take care of it so I get the maximum benefit from my pickup truck. I have here, and this was made, uh, printed by the people of the Chevrolet division. It says right there, Chevrolet of General Motors. I have here another owner's manual. It was made, printed, pr- uh, released, if you will, by the manufacturer, the maker of me. It's God's word. That's how I look at the Bible. It's kind of like an owner's manual. God wrote it. He knows me best. Uh, He made it, made me. And so I turn to this when I have problems in life, when things aren't running right, when I've got issues, when I want to maximize my life uh, and being on this planet and who I am. I turn to this book. It's meant to be the owner's manual for people of faith, for all people in general. And so the question is, uh, some people who don't understand Scripture, uh, sadly, they think it's outdated and irrelevant. And I, am nev- I never cease to be amazed at how up-to-date and current, how relevant God's Word is. And I understand it for what it is. It's not a science textbook. It doesn't claim to be. So it's not going to answer all the, the finer nuances of origins and timetables. It tells us enough of how God created to put us into perspective. Uh, it's not a psychology book. Uh, it's not a business book. But it speaks to all those dimensions of life Uh, and gives us enough to go on. It's not a comprehensive revelation of who God is and everything about him. We still have questions, but it gives us enough. It's sufficient to live an effective life of faith. And so I want to kind of prove the relevance of Scripture today by kind of doing a a flyby of the landscape of life, see if you can find yourself in it, and see how those people, how you, are in this book. Let's first of all talk about if you're a single parent We have lots of single parents at CLC. About 25% of kids live in single-parent homes. And when I preached this in 1990, uh, the first time through, there were 12.7 million uh, single-parent homes. Uh, Two and a half million of those were were single dads. The rest were single moms. Uh, Good news, bad news, that number has grown, unfortunately. There are now 18 million single-parent homes. Three million are single-parent dads, and the rest are single-parent moms. And parenting is a challenge. Uh, Joyce and I did it together, and I still found myself maxed out at times in being a dad. I can only imagine how uphill it is to be a single mom, single dad. My hat is off to you. And at CLC, we want to help you. We want to support you in that. And uh, if I were a single parent, I, as, a, as, a, as a married parent, I did this. If I were a single parent, I would be sure uh, that I would have my children here every weekend I could. Every midweek I would have them here because we have great adults and young people who want to pour into the lives of your child. And I found that I needed not just me and Joyce, I needed other Christians pouring into my son, my daughter, uh, helping make a difference in their lives. I wasn't enough. And so, boy, especially as a single parent, don't cheat yourself of that. And uh, being a single parent, you can sometimes feel like you're odd man out. Uh, you can barely hold things together. You have to be mom and dad. You have to be all things to, to your kids. It's a challenge. And you might wonder if God sees you, if God notices, if you matter. Let me tell you, nothing could be further from the truth. And I'd like to, to take you to a, a lesson that we learn about a single parent and to every single mom, every single dad that's out there. Uh, God's plan includes you and your child. All right, so would you just say, he includes me, if you're a single parent, he includes me. He includes my kids, all right? And uh, a great example of that is in 1 Kings. I'm not going to put these verses on the screen because I've got a ton I'm going to go through this week. You might want to jot it down. There's a compelling story in 1 Kings uh, chapter 17 that shows how single parents and their kids matter to God. We're looking at a single mom here, and uh, she happens to be single through widowhood, and she has a son who's probably elementary age. 
And it says in 1 Kings uh, 17, verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, that's the territory he lived in, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So question, you ever have God speak to your heart about something and he kind of lets it stew there for a while. He asks you for some sacrifice, for some way to serve, to be involved in some way. And maybe you had that debate going on. I can't afford it. I don't know if I can. Why would you ask me? Whatever the case, it doesn't fit. It's inconvenient, right? That was probably going on in her mind when Elijah meets her. I'll not read the story, but let me kind of tell you through, talk you through it, that uh, that story comes about and, and Elijah meets her. She's gathering sticks, firewood. And he says to her, uh, bring me a drink of water, would you please? And she, he says, and when you do, bring me a, a piece of bread, a bread cake. And she says to him, uh, the water I can handle, she says, she says to him, I've just got enough flour and oil to make a, a serving of bread for my son and I. My plan was to take these sticks, make a fire, take the water, the flour and the oil, mix them together, make enough bread for he and I, eat that, and then we we're going to die. Talk about at the end of her rope. You ever been there, mom, dad, especially if it was, as a single? Probably have. Out of hope, despair, feeling like whatever prayer she'd been offering, God sort of denied those, wasn't attending to those for her son and for herself. And then Elijah kind of pushes back on that. And in verse 13, Elijah said to her, do not fear. And I want to say that that message echoes through the centuries of time to every single mom, every single dad. Right now in a pandemic season, anxiety may be rising high. Uh, we've gotten some feedback on the chat room that, wow, my kids are acting out. It's going so long. I say to you again, do not fear. God sees you. God sees your child, sees your family, and he cares about you. His plans include you. Do, do not fear. Go and do as I've said. Make a little cake, bread cake for me first, then bring it out to me. Afterwards, you may make one for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, and God provided for her. It reminds me in Malachi where the prophet says to, to, to test me now in this uh, Put me first financially. Give your tithes and offerings and see if I open the windows of heaven to pour out a blessing too great to contain. He's testing this widow. She complies. She puts God first. She puts his prophet first. And she sees God intervene and he provides for her needs all the way through that drought. Single mom, single dad, put God first. He wants to provide for you and your kids all the way through this pandemic and beyond. And so by way of educating, there are hundreds of people watching this right now. Those of you who are single parents, educate the rest of us. Share some of the challenges you're facing right now during this pandemic as a single parent. You can you need use prayer for that, but also just to let others know, wow, that, that's a challenge. They're, they're going through that. I'm not facing it quite that way. To help us to be more sensitive to each other. Take a moment. What are some of the things you're facing as a single parent? And then parenting is a challenge in general, married or not. And as I said, when we raised our kids, I found that I needed all the help I could get from people at CLC, other brothers and sisters in Christ, other parents, friends, uh, to do that in some ways together. And the Bible, as God's handbook, gives us great information, great teaching on how to raise our kids. In Ephesians chapter 6 is the verse I heard my mom quote. It kind of gives leverage to the obedience idea. Uh, verse 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. goes on to say that it's the first commandment with a promise. That's from the Ten Commandments. And the promise is that it will be well with you and you'll live long on the earth. Sociologists and psychologists now confirm to us the validity of this promise. And they will tell you that a life that is well lived, that one of the keys to that is to living a long, healthy life physically, but also a healthy, productive life, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, professionally, and always, is to have a healthy relationship with mom and dad. And that foundation becomes really a, a standard, a foundation for, for living a productive life. And then he gives some advice to parents, fathers, but mothers as well. Parents, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That idea of discipline and instruction is not just uh, with, a, with, a, with a, a whiteboard or a chalkboard or with an with a, with a iPad, I guess, teaching your kids. It's, it's discipline. It's living out for your children how to live. It's modeling for them God's word. 
how to apply God's word in your life, how to live out just principles and truths, facts and theories in your life, and how to model that for them as well, that they can become the man or woman that God created them to be. And so I'm curious, uh, parents in general, what challenges are you facing now, especially during the, this COVID crisis, all right? Go ahead and add that to the chat room, not just single parents, but all parents. What are the challenges you're facing? And to any parent, if you have some helpful suggestions, something that's really been good for you, share that with the hundreds that are watching online and they could pick up some helpful tidbits there. Understand that God's, this book, God's Word, uh, really is a handbook on relationships. It teaches me how to have a relationship with God, the one who created me and wrote this. If he said it, I believe it. It teaches me about how to have a relationship with me. I mean, in one of the greatest commandments, love your neighbor, what, as yourself? I'm to have a healthy sense of love and esteem for me uh, before I can ever have it for other people. It shows me how to love others, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. A handbook on relationships with people. Bear each other's burdens. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. It's a handbook on relationships with my environment as well. We are be stewards of that. Subdue the earth and fulfill it. And so when we understand the Bible from that perspective, it takes on a whole new sense of meaning and significance in our everyday lives. Uh, if you are a single adult, set aside the parenthood. I want to speak to you for a moment because uh, it's often said that we live in a couple-oriented world and sometimes you can feel odd man out. The worst thing that you could do as a, as a person of the book is to live your life according to marital status and if you're single, to live as though life has to be on pause, on hold. Uh, and I can think of the words from a very well-known single adult, the Apostle Paul, and he wrote some words in Philippians that apply to a lot of situations. In this particular circumstance, he was talking about giving and finances, but it applies to, to our marital status as well. In Philippians 4.11, he says, Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Learn to be content in your marital status as a single adult. Oh, that's too hard to do. Well, two verses later, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can learn a contentment, a sense of, ah, I'm good inside while being single. And you can also find that, you know what, with that perspective, it's not a matter of just coping with life, surviving life. It's a matter of thriving in life. That same single adult, the Apostle Paul, wrote in Philippians 3, brethren, sisters, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, perfection, but one thing I do, say one thing, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is good for singles and married, for all of us. Forget what lies behind. Don't stay tethered to your past. Learn from it, be thankful for it, and then move on and reach forward to what God has for you. It's not a matter of oh, once I'm married, once I have a family, once I have whatever. We can cheat ourselves living in the once I haves. No, who are you and what does God have for you now? Maximize that identity and realize you're a work in process. Philippians 1.6, one of my favorite life verses, I am confident of this very thing. He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. You're a work in process. God's got his hands on your life, and he's not done with you yet. And let me just say as a side note to married couples, uh, that idea of learning to be content in your marital status, that's not just for singles. I did some math a while back, and in 40 years of ministry, I've spent between four and 5,000 hours in counseling sessions with people, uh, probably 60% of those with married couples. And uh, we tend to look at other people who have things that we don't, are in a different place in life than we are, and we idealize that, like, oh, they have the perfect job, perfect marriage, perfect kids, perfect house, perfect whatever, and then we don't. But I have sat with many married couples who their expectations of the marriage and their experience, there's a huge gap. And they're trying to live with that dissatisfaction, that disappointment gap and, and I've had to say to them, and you might be there today, and there might be an awkward silence in the room right now if you're there with your spouse because expectations versus experience are hugely different. I would suggest to you to learn to be content during that experience gap, during that expectations difference. Learn to be content 
in the marriage that you're in with the spouse that you're with, with the spouse that you are, and then pray for God to help you be more realistic in your expectations now that you know who you've married and, and to improve your experience to be the best husband or wife you can bring to that. It really applies to all of us. Another thought about uh, not only single adults, but really all of us in general is what about our sexual morality? If there is an area in 30 years that I've seen deteriorate or slip as far as the standard that we've had and understanding that we've had is that people of the book are starting to think more and more like people without it, live like people without it. In fact, sociologists during that 30-year period have done studies, Christian sociologists, and they basically, they sadly tell us, when you look at the values, attitudes, and behaviors and lifestyles of people who are not professing Christians and compare it to professing Christians, people of God's word, the differences are negligible. That's not to be. We're supposed to be salt and light to our world. And we look at the increasing moral darkness and emotional darkness of our world. If we're not being that light, no wonder if the light ceases to shine. And if there's an area that I've seen this, this deterioration in, uh, it's in the area of understanding our bodies and our sexual morality. Paul says uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, Flee immorality. Say flee. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against their own body. Do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? In our neighborhood, Joyce and I have noticed in our neighborhood walks that there are some, some yard sign battles, debates going on. And there's a couple of the neighborhoods, neighbors who have prayed to end abortion. Another neighbor has put up, every woman has a right to choose. And you watch that debate happen, okay, and you wonder about it. We obviously pray for God to end abortion. Sadly, the idea of a woman's right to choose is based on, predicated on a truth that's not biblical, saying it's my body, I have a right to my body. No, if we're people of the word, if he said it and I believe it, then his word said that I am not my own, I've been bought with a price. So this really is not mine. It's not mine to choose what to do with when it comes to a woman's right to choose to keep a child or not. And so Paul says, you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. And so that's meant to guide our sexual behavior and to realize that the more we understand sexual intimacy as an act between a husband and a wife, it's a life-uniting act with life-uniting intent in a life-uniting relationship for life. That is when sex is safe sex. Uh, it is free from injury and disease and regret. It's the gift that God intended it to be. And another thought about uh, single and choosing a spouse before I go on, I don't know that I can give you any examples of people who did not go by this guideline and didn't regret it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul, verse 14 says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What harmony has Christ with the devil? Or what is a believer in common with an unbeliever? If we really love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, that relationship with God, that passionately, how can we become a soulmate with someone who doesn't share that love, who doesn't share that passion? So as you are looking or considering someone to, to join your life with, if you're single, uh, look for someone who has the same level of spiritual connection and commitment and interaction with God. All right, well, that's a whole lot about adults and marriage and family and kids. But what about if you're younger than that? What about teenagers? Does God's word really apply to you? All right, well, I would say absolutely that it does. And uh, there's lots of good references to that. If you're under the age of 20, still a teenager, how old do you think some of our greatest Bible heroes were? I mean, when David killed Goliath, he had to be a, somewhere between 14 and 17 years of age. He wasn't of, of military age yet. He was a teenager when he did one of the greatest, most courageous acts of history. When you look at Joseph, when Joseph was, was taken by his brothers and sold into slavery, he was 17 years old, a year after you can get your driver's license nowadays. And when he had the dream from God that he would do something great and his brothers would bow down and pay homage to him, he was younger than that, early teen years. And yet God gave Joseph a dream 
how he would be in a position of world prominence. He'd become number two to the greatest emperor in the world, the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, number two to him, and God gave him that sense of dream and destiny when he was just a teenager. You look at uh, other places. Likewise, Joseph, talk about sibling rivalry. And if you've got issues with a brother, a sister, a stepbrother or sister, uh, boy, Joseph had that as well. I mean, there was a lot going on there. And God gives us, through his word, a glimpse into the lives of other teenagers. God has a plan to involve you in his plan with your life. You can go even earlier than that. Okay, so once they're 13, no, go younger. Samuel was a great prophet of God, and I reference him just about every time that we do a baby dedication. And after his mother dedicated Samuel to God, some years later, as an elementary-aged child, he went to live at the temple to serve the priest in the acts of worship. And, and it was kind of like a, a, an ancient version of, a, of an altar boy and kind of like a boarding school as well because he lived there at the temple. And so the Bible tells us that young Samuel is asleep one night, uh, elementary age, and he hears a voice calling him, Samuel, Samuel. He wakes up, thinks it's Eli. You ever kind of wake up from your sleep? You're not sure if it was a dream or it was real? Man, a couple nights ago, I swear somebody was banging on our front door, and I woke up. I was like, was that a dream? Was that real? And I walked out, and there was nobody there, right? So Samuel had that experience, okay? And so Samuel goes to Eli, and Eli goes, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Happens again. Second time, Samuel comes. Eli says, no, it wasn't me. And he realizes God's speaking to this child. He says, next time that you hear that voice, say, speak, Lord, your servant listens. And so sure enough, a third time, Samuel, Lord calls him. Samuel says, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And then listen to what God says to Samuel. A child, you have it like a 10-year-old, 12-year-old in your house, parents? Spoke to that age of a child. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. God's got something. He's, got, he's going to flip things upside down. Talk about upheaval in the nation of Israel, starting in Eli's household. And he tells a child that. Parents, don't underestimate the spiritual potential of your sons and daughters of every age. See the kingdom potential in the lives of your teenage sons and daughters. It goes way beyond winning trophies or being popular or having fun. Be a person of the book and raise your kids with a sense of God has a sense of destiny and purpose that he wants to accomplish in my child's life. How do I best support them in that perspective? And going through this pandemic, Wednesday night, as I said, I interviewed, along with Pastor Chris, four of our graduating seniors. I was so impressed with their insights, with their maturity and how they're going through this. Yes, they had disappointment, discouragement, a lot of things that were lost uh, from their, their senior year. But they emerged from that with great insights about priorities, how this pandemic is teaching them what's important and what's not, and how they're going to go forward in life different than when they came into it. And parents, I would say the same thing to like all of us. What are we learning during the pandemic what are the insights we're having, the aha moments about our priorities, how we spend our time, how we spend ourselves, that, boy, when we go through it, we want to carry that forward with us. We want to learn from that. God help us if we literally have a, so far, once in a generation experience. There may be more to come, but in my lifetime, there's never been something this extensive with this amount of implication societally. God help us if we go through all that and we never really realize, whoa, He's trying to get my attention, teach me something, reignite a passion in me, accomplish things in me, in us, through us, like he never has before. And so let's leave the pandemic as our society is now starting to open up with pandemic insights. We look back and say, wow, I'm thankful I got through that because God has helped change me and transform me in that. And if you've been around a while, if you're in retirement age or heading that direction and you're wondering, okay, what do I do now? Is God done with me? Well, if you've been at CLC long enough, you know that my conviction is if he gave you breath today and you're aware of what's going on right now and I'm talking, then he's not done with you. Just say it. He's not done yet. All right? And so what can I do? Well, first of all, one of the greatest things you can do is one of the most important things to do. Every first Wednesday of the month we do as a church, we have a prayer time, prayer. I believe the great things that happen through our God-sized vision 
are largely because we started in prayer. And every month we pray about our God-sized vision. And so you can be a person of prayer. You can pray for people in your life. Pray for me. Pray for our church. Pray for our leaders. Pray for our community. You can be a person of prayer. Second, I was talking to Ryan Munger, who leads our kids' ministries, this past week. And he said, you know, what would be great, we were talking, would it be great if all the people at CLC that are like grandparentish age, I don't care if you're retired yet or not, would donate their time. And so if this is you, and you're wondering, what does God want to do with me, then I'm telling you, okay, when we open back up, you better hightail it to Pastor, uh, to Pastor Ryan Munger or a member of our kids' team and tell them, I want to volunteer and I will be a class grandparent on Saturday night, every Saturday, or every Sunday at 9 or 1040. I will be there for what? Third graders, second graders, kindergartners, whatever. I want to be there just to love those kids, to help the teacher, and just let them know we care. You may wonder, well, what's the, what's the biblical pattern of that? Oh, my goodness. You go to Titus, and Paul is talking there about one of the benefits of a church like CLC. Unfortunately, a lot of my pastor peers, when I talk to them about their church, their church has been around a while, and it's mostly older folk. There's, there's no younger people there. Or you have some, they often call them hipster churches, where everybody's like under 40, and it's, it's a real rock and roll kind of crowd. What we have is, is all the above. We span the generations, have about equal uh, chunks of people uh, from children and youth and young families and sort of middle families and then retired folks all the way across that. And those of you at the later end of that spectrum, Titus says, let older men be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, love, perseverance. Older women likewise gives them instructions. Why? So that the older women can encourage the younger women and the older men can encourage the young men. And there's meant to be a cross-pollination and a benefit from one generation to the next to the next. Do that, be that, in this body of Christ of Christian Life Center, and we'll be richer for it. On the flip side, if you'd say, well, I don't have that role yet, I'm not doing that now, then wow, you're cheating us of the blessing you can be, all right? Nothing else. Maybe you decide when we come back that uh, you're going to make it your goal that you're going to buy a cup of coffee for somebody younger than you. And it's kind of sobering. When we were in that chat uh, Wednesday night, and I found out all their ages, I am like more than twice as old as all those grads, okay? So maybe you say, I'm going to buy a cup of coffee for somebody 20 years younger than me every week. And maybe you, that's your entry line. Hey, I just decided I'm going to buy coffee for somebody younger than me every week. Want to join me over here in the cafe? And just, just to cross-pollinate, just to mingle, just to encourage each other. Regardless of where you're at in life, a parent or not, married or single, young or old, God has a, has a path for you to follow, and God's word, the Bible, is relevant to you. And to close, you know, there's, there's, there's a few verses that, that apply to all of us. Um, let me ask you this. What, is, what are your most common sins? All right? And you're like, well, what are you talking about sins? I, my conviction, what I've seen over life, is that all of us have areas that we're tempted. If Satan tempted Jesus to sin, he's going to take his best shot at us. But I find that people don't all sin the same. If we were to take a poll, in fact, uh, let's take a poll on chat. Do you like salty or sweet? If you have to choose, go ahead and put it down there. All right? Um, ice cream or cake? Put it down there. All right? What you'll find is that not everybody's tempted to the same thing. Okay? When it comes to sin, some might be tempted to sexual misbehavior or sexual lustful thoughts. Some might be tempted to gossip and talking about people. Some of your temptation is just you're, you're so discontent and envious of other people. Maybe it, you can't be truthful. Whatever your temptations are, the Bible says in Psalm 119.11, your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Find verses that speak about the value of truth, how to love other people and not gossip, how to have a pure heart and to avoid sexual temptation. Find verses like that. Memorize them. Put them where you'll see them. And you'll find, because when Jesus was tempted by Satan, what did Jesus do? He quoted verses of Scripture back. We know those times of temptation. Read those verses to yourself out loud. It's amazing how it protects you from sin. How about going through suffering? All of us, at the very least, are suffering in position during this COVID uh, episode. Some are suffering truly. I've been a good friend of ours that we prayed for that heads up World Missions for the Assemblies of God, Greg Mundus, almost died, was care flighted to St. Louis from Springfield, Missouri. Thank God he's on the mend and recovering as an answer to prayer. Others have lost loved ones through this. 
Some have been very inconvenienced where you've been uh, stuck at home and you've lost your job, lost income. Some of us, it's been minimal. I, we've kept going to work every day as essential employees, and so it's just been busier, but it hasn't felt near as different. But as we go through that, what about other times of suffering? You know, Joyce and I have had to, have to walk through the diagnosis of her breast cancer, and she has chemo treatment number two coming up Wednesday, and, and dealing with that, a time of suffering. Maybe you've got an illness in your family or with a loved one, or maybe it's a hard financial crisis or career issues, whatever the case might be. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 71, it's good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. You have heard me say that God doesn't waste pain if we let him doesn't waste heartache and strain. He causes all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I'm not saying that every tragedy always has a happy ending or a pleasant outcome, but God can still teach us, grow us, and shape us during those hard times. Joyce and I, we take walks when she feels up to it uh, through the neighborhood. We were talking about that verse in James where it talks about considering it joy when you have various trials because it refines you. And how do you, how do you go through hard stuff and allow God to refine you? I'll confess that as the psalmist said there, when I go through the trials, it's when I turn to God's word the most and it shapes me. And then Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Is it, Christian, would people say, boy, they live their life by the morality, by the wisdom, by the principles, by the hope and the peace of that book? If he said it, I believe it. And if he said it, I believe it. Do I live it? It's meant to be a lamp to my feet, to guide me through the circumstances of life. And if you're here, again, Psalm 119, longest chapter in the Bible, it's all about the blessings and benefits of God's Word. And in that same chapter, he says in, in verse 176, I've gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. And if you're here today and you're watching this and you followed God, had a relationship with him at one time, but you've strayed, you know the truth of this, though, that the Bible says that train up a child in the way they should go. When they're old, they'll not depart from it. Sometimes there's some intermediate wanderings. But this person says, here, I've strayed, but, but I don't forget your commandments. Those words, those truths come echoing back to me. That's because the Holy Spirit, friend, is re-reminding you of the truth that you once knew and walked by. And he's reminding you how much he loves you and wants to call you back to, 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 to dry away the confusion, the bitterness, the guilt, the disappointment, whatever the case might be. And he wants to, to draw you back to that loving relationship with a God who cares about you. And so I want to close with uh, a verse that's a promise from Christ that applies during this coronavirus pandemic season. And indeed, we trust we're on the upward swing and we're opening the economy and things are starting to come back. And, and I trust that's the way it's going to go. We'll share reopening plans in the next couple of weeks. But we don't know. It could take an about face and do a dive again. All hell could break loose. If not now, there'll certainly be other crises, other things to happen in the future, whether it's a natural disaster, economic, a pandemic, political, military. I don't know who knows what it is. The world is full of it. But Jesus said this in John chapter 16. Verse 33 says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Peace. Take a deep breath. I didn't have to say peace. Peace. I've spoken this to you. And what has he spoken? He said, in the world you have tribulation. In the world you have pandemics. In the world you have economic crises. In the world you have layoffs. In the world you have rejection and pain and heartache. But take courage. Take courage. God's people, people of this book, are people who learn to take courage, not in who we are, but in whose we are, and that God cares for us. Go back to the beginning of this book. And when Joshua was leading the people into the promised land, he said, be strong and what? Be courageous. You're going to face some challenges. They were going to face some battles, some armed enemies. But God was going to give it into their plans. You, my friend, are going to face battles and challenges ahead of you. And Jesus says, take courage. Why? Because I have overcome the world. The implication is simple. You are mine. 
The Bible says we have Christ within us, the hope of glory. If I'm a person of the book, he said that, I believe it, that I have Christ within me. And regardless of the tribulations and trials that come my way, I can take courage and be courageous because as he overcame, so also will I because he'll not leave me or forsake me. As such, those kinds of promises, this book is God's promise book to us. Promise never to leave us. Promise to be our Savior and forgive us. He promised to make a place for us. He promised someday a new heaven and a new earth and that we would be with Him. And as people of the book, we build our life on this foundation. And as this song says, we stand confidently on those promises from God. Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing on the promise of the cross. My hope will not be shaken. My eyes are fixed on who you are. Standing, standing. Standing on the promise. I cannot fall Listening every moment to the Spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my only all Standing on the promises of God We're 
Christ makes free, standing on.